So I'm Mark Shaw. Uh, I'm one for HP. Uh, and some of you may know that uh, I graduated from Purdue in 2015, December 2015. Uh, Professor Bell and Professor Alabach were my co advisors. Uh, and I walked in the summer of 2016. So that's when I went to the graduation ceremony. So what I wanted to talk about a little bit today is my journey, uh, my career at HP, and some things that I've learned along the way. Uh, and, you know, also hopefully share some nuggets with you, because you may be wondering, you know, your career, what is your career going to look like? What is your experience uh, going to be as you go out into the industry? But before we do that, I want to ask you a question, and it's a very important question. These two bars here in the middle, either side of them, what color are they? How many colors do you see on the screen? Focus on this one and this one. For those online, we're specifically talking about this vertical and this vertical. Okay. How many people think that this is the same color as this? You do. You're actually correct. This is a visual phenomenon where your visual system is being fooled by the context of the surround. So, you know, as engineers, we do all of this work to drive metrics, quality engineering. And, you know, it's our goal to make sure that we get the smallest mean squared error or whatever the metric might be of the problem. But there are some instances, and in my industry, especially when it comes to color, you're actually dealing not just with physics, you're also dealing with human perception. And sometimes, although you may be driving to a really, really good key metric with a really good result, what you find is that it's not actually the desired intended result. And sometimes you know, your career can be like that too, right? If you're driving and you're driving on metrics and you're not considering the factors around you, how do you know that you're going to the right place? Some people like to think that their career is a straight line. I'm here today, my goal is to be the CEO of Microsoft, let's just say, it's not, but if it was, and to get from here to there, it's a straight line. But the reality is that your journey is not a straight line. As you go from where you are today to where you want to be in life, you will find that your life is not a straight path. So my journey, uh, I started back in the UK, I grew up in London. Uh, I graduated from my undergraduate degree in graphic media studies in 1997. And when I was there, I got really interested in this thing called color, right? Color science was fascinating to me. I did an internship at a company called 3M. You may have heard of that. You may not have heard of a company called Imation. Imation was actually a spin-off of 3M. And I was a student doing an internship at 3M when they got spun off. And in England, the way that it works is, is you work for an entire year. You do a full 12 month internship. And then during the, that internship, I became an, you know, an intern in animation. And I was really interested. And I said to, to, the, to the guy that I was working with, uh, his name was Chris Edge and he was working for 3M in St. Paul, Minnesota at the time. I said, hey, Chris, this, this color stuff is really interesting to me. How do I learn more about this kind of stuff? And he said, well, hey, there's a university called RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. You should go ahead and you should talk to them and uh, you know, take, take a look. Now, you've got to remember here, I come from a school in London. It's a no-name school, right? It's, a very, it's not like a prestigious school. I didn't really know what a master's degree was. I didn't know what it was. I'd never paid a penny of tuition in my life. I came from a culture at the time where government paid for tuition. 
My parents, my dad's an accountant. My mother was not into the technical field. She was a secretary. I didn't understand academia. So I applied to RIT, not really knowing what I was applying to. Uh, and I, I received on Easter Monday of 1997, I received this letter from RIT saying, uh, congratulations, we're giving you a full scholarship and stipend to come to RIT. I had no idea what I was reading. I had never heard the word stipend. I didn't really know what a scholarship was. I'm like, all right, pack my bags, I'm off. So that's when I came to the US. I worked, uh, I studied at RIT, and after I graduated, I went to applied science fiction. Now I was offered the possibility of doing a PhD when I graduated from RIT. And the idea of doing a PhD intrigued me. I was very interested in the, in the idea of doing a PhD, but I wasn't sure that I was ready. And what was really interesting is sometimes in life, we get told things that we don't want to hear, but they're true. Sometimes we have to listen to them because I could have chosen to stay at RIT and do a PhD in imaging science I probably would have had a really bad time. Because, but one of my advisors at the time said to me, Mark, I, I don't think you're ready. And that was hard to hear, right? You're not ready to do this thing that you've been given an opportunity to do. But I listened to him. And then I, so I went to work for Applied Science Fiction in Austin, Texas. This was a startup company. How many of you actually remember camera film? C41 camera film, the day of a camera where you actually opened the back and you dropped a roll of film in it and you, you, met, you connected it and you wound it up and took a photograph and sent it away to have it developed. Does anybody remember those days? You know, some of you. Well, in 1999 to 2000 was right around the time that digital photography was starting to take off, right? It was growing and it was growing fast, but Applied Science Fiction was a company that was trying to digitize conventional camera film. What they didn't really appreciate was the speed at which digital photography would just take off. In the two to three years of time from 99 to 2002, the digital photography industry just took off and their business, their value proposition of their business pretty much, you know, died. So I worked for Applied Science Fiction and I, and I, I was on a startup, right? And, you know, when you talk about startups back in the early 2000s, you know, you hear these crazy stories and they're real, you know, like 150 people going to a boat party at a beach in Austin, Texas, with a budget that was just limitless and crazy. And you think, where's, well, at the age of 25, I didn't really think, where's the money coming from to spend this? It was all venture capital, right? It was all external investors. And then the, the employees were just you know, spending the money. Now, today, I kind of look at that and think, is that really such a good thing? At the time, I thought it was great. But I realized that you know, this, this ship wasn't necessarily going to stay afloat because digital photography was taking off so fast. So I went to work for Xerox Engineering Systems in Santa Clara, California. I was there for 18 months. And my daughter was born in September of 2001. Uh, 2002. September of 2002. <laughs> and the reason I remember is because I found out two months later that Xerox was closing the entire business. They weren't just selling it, or they weren't just spinning it off. They literally shut the entire business down. So what, what aspect of the Xerox business was this? It was called Xerox Engineering Systems. They made 36 inch wide format, 60 inch wide format inkjet printers. So the, the company that made them was Olympus, and we essentially was an OEM provider. And, uh, and I was working on kind of, it was high-end graphics. So, you know, big, big posters and banners and that kind of thing. And I was working on them. 
And, you know, my daughter was born in September. And then two months later, I find out you have no job in one month. Right? So think about, you know, your journey. When you think about these stepping stones. That was not a stepping stone that I put on my journey, that I wanted to have on my journey. But it was a real one. And it's one that I remember talking to the, to the, the recruiter at the time, because Xerox, you know, they, they were good. They didn't just say, oh, like, you're all out. Not well. They actually scheduled a recruiter to work with each of their employees so that we could try and find another job. And the recruiter was actually, she's like, you know what? This is great. You know, you actually, you know, you're trying. There are some people that they, they give up. And she said, you're trying. So I, I was trying. Heck, I was really trying, right? I got a two-month-old baby. I'm, I'm going to get a job. So I had two opportunities at that point. One, one opportunity was uh, HP. Another opportunity was working for Lexmark in Kentucky. And if you're not familiar, Lexmark is, is a competitor of HP, right? They make printers as well. At the time, that was a hard decision. Do I go to Lexington, Kentucky with rolling green hills and horse pastures and, you know, really, really nice affluent, like, culture? Or do I go to some place called Boise, Idaho that I have never heard of? It's in a desert. I have no idea. But with a company called HP, and I, I know HP, right? They're they're a big company. Well, I chose to go to HP. And I've been there for, uh, for 20 years, just, just recently. But when I arrived at HP, I remember Professor Alaba came one summer in around 2005. And uh, you know, HP and Purdue have been working together for a number of years. I don't know how many years, Jan, probably over 25 years, if not more, on research. And I, I saw Professor Alabach and I went up to him and said, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Mark, I'm new here. This whole idea of a PhD has never really left my mind. I was given the opportunity at RIT, but I'd kind of like to, to explore that option with Purdue. Now, I, I did not really understand where Purdue stood in the rankings of, you know, schools. And he said, sure, well, why don't you come to, to, to West Lafayette and meet with the uh, admissions advisor, Professor Ong. So I did, I, I came along and, and we sat down and yeah, you know, I come from a no-name school. My undergraduate degree was not electrical engineering. My master's degree was color science. And he sat down and he looked at my resume and he's like, yeah, if you wanna come to Purdue, you're gonna kind of have to go back and kind of cover some of these double E fundamentals. And you've got to get to this level in order to enroll in this program. So I said, okay, let me go away and think about it. And basically what I did was I started working on a five-year bridge program. Bridge program as in I would drive down across the bridge to Boise State University taking one class a semester part-time while I was working full-time. I went back to, you know, the basics. I had to go back all the way back to Calc 1, right? Because I hadn't done that stuff in almost 10 years. So I was, gosh, in 2005, I was 30 years old. So I worked part-time. At Boise State University for five years. I went through Cal 1, Cal 2, did BQ, then I went through Signals and Systems, all the way, all the way up to Signals and Systems, doing classes part time so that I could then enroll here in September 2010. And that was the good old days of the qualifying exam, which I hear are no longer, no longer can happen. <laughs> I took my QE in the, in the summer of 2011, and then uh, I graduated in December of 2015. So when we talk about your career journey is not a straight line, this is what I mean. There will be bumps, 
There will be roadblocks. There will be things that happen to you. Or every step of the way. And the question that I would pose to you would be, what is it you really want out of your life and out of your career? For some people, it's the money. For some people, it's the glory. For some people, it's other things. You might say to me, well, did you get a pay raise for getting a PhD? The answer is no. It wasn't about the money. Well, why? Why would you do that? Well, for me, part of the thing is that I enjoy what I'm doing right now. I enjoy communicating. I enjoy sharing my experiences and my knowledge with other students. Well, Boise State in 2017 asked me if I would come and teach a class for them in image process. So now I'm at, because I have now the ability to, because I have a PhD, I can now take that skill and I can now disseminate to other students. So I've been using those skills that I've been learning in my job and in my career, but also through my training and my education to help grow the knowledge of the next generation, right? You guys, the ones that, your learning skills and things that, that weren't in existence when I went to college in 1997. So you can see my, my journey, my academic career has been somewhat unconventional, right? I am not an academic scholar. You know, if you look at my high school transcripts, you will see that I am not your idea of, you know, straight A's, that, that is not me, right? But the point is, is that if, if you set your goal and your objective and desire on something, you can work through the roadblocks. You can overcome the roadblocks. You can reach what it is that is important to you. But it takes determination and it takes grit sometimes things come easy you know when i look at my career i've also had similar experiences you know i started out as a as a basic specialist engineer in the laser jet division and now i'm a distinguished technologist and strategist and you may say well what on earth does that mean right does he actually do any real work <laughs> Right. Well, what that means is, is I work with the senior vice presidents and the vice presidents to and the directors to identify technologies and to help help them strategize on the trends in the market and the, and the technology. So, you know, one of the big questions is AI ML. How does that influence your industry and in the printing industry? How do we use AI ML? There are very many other examples that, that we could, could come up with. But what's important to know is that, you know, disappointment didn't just come through my academic career. When I was about to come to, to Purdue University in 2010, I was put up for a promotion. And right before I was, right before I was coming to Purdue, and my manager, my director at the time said to me, Mark, he said, I'm not going to promote you right now. And you're like, oh. you know, I've worked really hard for this. I, you know, he said, the worst thing I can do is promote you before you go to Purdue for nine months. Because in the, in the industry, it's a dog eat dog, right? Your, what you, your, your output is what you're measured upon. And if you're in Purdue for nine months, you're not going to be outputting a lot of business stuff. You're going to be outputting a lot of like blood, sweat, and tears studying <laughs> 600 and other classes, right? Yeah, those of you that can resonate with me, <laughs> fond memories of that class. <laughs> um, so uh, it was hard at the time, it was hard to hear that now's not the time for us to promote you. But I said, okay, I'll take that and I'll, I'll wait. So I did. And what was interesting was when I got back from Purdue and I studied for the QE exam, the day of the QE exam of 2011 was the day that I got promoted to that next level. 
Then in 2018, 2019, I was up for promotion to the next level. And yet again, what happened? My boss's boss said, now's not the time. Because you may or may not know, but HP purchased Samsung's printing division in around the 2017-2018 time frame. And you know, Samsung is a very highly respected, very well respected company in Korea, if you don't know who they are. And what rock have you been hiding under? <laughs> <laughs> but their printing division wasn't well known. And HP was very interested in getting into a new segment of printers and Samsung had developed their own technology, A3 printers. Well, Samsung has a lot of very skilled technical people, right? I mean, to work at Samsung in Korea is a very highly sought after thing. It's not, it's not like yeah, every old Joe on the street gets to work at Samsung. So my managers, uh, my, my technical advice, kind of mentor said to me, he said, now's not the time. We're about to bring in however many thousands of people from Korea. You don't want to be doing this right now. So the, the guidance was wait. So I did. I waited almost a year. And then my boss says to me, okay, now's the time. We should, we should apply now. So then you can see that in 2018, I was promoted to a distinguished technologist in the, in the printing division. So sometimes people ask me, you know, what's, what is it? We call it the TCP, the technical career path. You know, what is it that takes in your career to go from what we would call an intermediate, which is a starting employee, Specialist is kind of like a graduate of a master's or a PhD. They have a specialist in a field to a fellow. And a fellow is kind of the highest technical rank in HP, right? So as you go from this one on the left, the intermediate to the, all the way up to the fellow, what is it that takes for you to succeed? And we have something called a packet, right? And a packet is, a document that you write that describes your contribution and your value to the business. And the point of this graph here in the bottom right is to say that it's not all about technical skill. Each of these levels has a clear set of attributes that the business may be looking for. And although I may think that I am God's gift to whatever thing I do, If I don't have the ability to communicate, or if I don't have the ability to think strategically, technically, or whatever criteria might be, just because I'm really skilled at one thing doesn't necessarily mean that I'm a good candidate for a promotion. So what we have to do is we have to recognize that as you go into the industry, as you go into your career, depending on your goal, you may have a different set of criteria. That as a, you move up in HP, as you move from the specialist up to the DT and the fellow, what you'll notice is that here in the bottom right, you can see that the technical and the digital literacy, they're important, very important down here in the early stages of your career. But as you start progressing up the technical career path, the TCP, what you'll find is that your ability to influence people and your understanding of the value of the business far outweighs now your technical skills. If you're not being asked, I want you to go design a convolution kernel that can solve this kind of problem or whatever the problem might be, machine learning algorithm, you're being asked, okay, if you look at our customers and if you look at our industry, what are the technologies that we need to bring to market or what are the customer experience issues that we need to address that are preventing us from making money in this segment? So 
So the higher you advance, the more important it is that you understand your business. So I have a question, but also ask a question. Uh, so the wonderful day after your career progression, Questions All right, so then I'll jump in. So I'm intrigued by something that you said about the ability to influence people and how that becomes. Are there certain sort of nuts and bolts things that one does so that then one has a better ability to influence people? Yeah, um, so influence comes in many factors, but in a company like HP, Communication skills are critical in your ability to influence. If you're an engineer and you want to sit in your cube and stare at your three walls of your cube all day long, and you never talk to anybody, you're gonna have a really hard time influencing somebody. Just because you have a brilliant idea doesn't mean that the rest of the world understands it, right? And, and sometimes you know, there, there's a phrase, kiss, keep it, keep it simple, stupid. Right? Sometimes we forget that you may be the expert in your field, in your topic of area of expertise by definition, because you're the one that's been spending all your time thinking about it, waking and sleeping hours probably. But the person across from you on the other side of the table or on the phone, they're thinking about very different problems. So how can you distill and dumb down your ideas? Not because they're dumb. We're not patronizing them. We're trying to put it into a form so that they can appreciate what it is you've done without having to know all of the details. You've heard, as you heard of the phrase, the elevator pitch, right? You meet somebody in the elevator and they say, what do you do? Do you start? telling them about how you use some fancy techniques to derive, derive a three by three matrix from this kind of whatever. No, because their, their eyes will glaze over, right? And they'll be like falling asleep. Try and keep it simple. So communication, the ability to convey what it is you're doing in a concise form is very important. Another thing is respect. Right? There will be people that will dis disagree with you. There will be people that don't believe you. And sometimes you see engineers, they get upset and they get frustrated because the other person's too dumb to understand what they're saying. That's not the case. Maybe it's the engineer's fault for not putting it in the in a phrase, in a context that that person can understand. There's a book, if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it, called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And in this book, Dale Carnegie, he's a salesman, right? And he's driving around and he's trying to sell stuff and he's having a really hard time. It's been many years since I've read it, but it was, a, it was a book that changed the way that I look at engineering. Because in that book, his mentor basically said to him, stop trying to sell them a wrench if they want a screwdriver. And I'm, I'm making that up, right? But he basically said, if you don't understand the needs of the customer, why are you even walking in there trying to sell them something? First of all, understand the problem that the customer has that they need to solve, then come in with a solution. Don't, don't come in with a solution for a problem they don't have and try and ram it down their throat, because that won't be a very successful sales technique. Very high, I highly recommend that book because in engineering, you are a salesperson. You're maybe not selling a physical object, you're selling your research or you're selling your, your algorithm. And you're trying to get your management to understand why it's important that your work be included in whatever product, whatever, you know, API library that's being released, whatever your application may be. So as engineers, we have a tendency to like the details, don't we? Right? You're, you're taught 
to focus on the details and to, to be data driven and to, to make sure. Well, in industry, when you're talking to a vice president, you really don't want to focus on the details because they don't want to know the details. But they do want to know that they trust you enough that if they have a question, you can answer the details. So, step out, look at that big picture. Don't just look at your piece of the pie. Try to understand the, the bigger, the more holistic picture. And that comes back to the influence question. What is it that is so important that your technology should be adopted or why you should your technology be adopted? And it may be bigger than just the problem that it's trying to solve. Try to step outside of that. What's, what's the value to the business? And then ask yourself the question of, should I be working on something if there is no real value to the business? Is it a valuable use of my time? You know? Okay. So these are the things that I've learned along the way. The style of communication that you use is very important. Businesses measure things on the return on the investment. So if there's a big investment and there's very little return, pretty much guarantee yourself that it's not gonna rate very highly. Know when to pick your battles, right? Just because somebody has a different opinion doesn't mean that they're wrong. Sometimes I need to listen to other people's opinions and I can learn from those opinions. Be willing to acknowledge when you're wrong. You know, I mess up. We all mess up, right? We're human. I got it wrong is a good answer sometimes because it builds trust. If, if your manager can look at you and say, hey, do you know why this happened? Yeah, because I screwed up. I made a mistake. I assumed this. Okay, they, you've learned in that process. They're not expecting perfection from you. A good company is not expecting perfection from you. They want you to grow through the process. And HP is very like that, you know, the culture at HP. They're willing for you to take risks. They want you to take risks. But they also want you to grow because you're not going to hit bat 100, as they say, right? You're not going to hit every ball out the park. And can you tailor your communication style to your audience? Not every audience wants to go into the nitty gritty details. When you think about your PhD defense or your freelance, just because you've done all this work doesn't mean that your committee necessarily wants to hear about it. Do you know what the rubric is? Is the rubric not just the technical accomplishment, but your, your growth as an engineer and your growth as a researcher? In the same way in business, it's not just about the accomplishment. So, I'm gonna finish with another visual experiment. So if we could turn the lights out and then we'll go to Q and A. So what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you this picture, okay? And what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> what's wrong with it? It's okay to you? Doesn't look right to me. Well, if you look at this side, the sky is kind of yellowish, right? And if you look at that side, it's blue. Is that a problem? If you were printing out this picture of your barn, because you lived in Kentucky, I guess, and you had a big red barn across the bridge, I would be upset if that's what came out. But what I want you to do is I want you to look at the black dot. Take, don't take your eyes off the black dot. 
stay focused on the black dot. And there's a reason why we're doing this because what we're doing is we're actually training your human visual system. Don't look at me, look at the black dot. And we're actually desensitizing the human visual system on the left side to yellow. And we're desensitizing it on the right side to cyan. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the exact same image. And now look left and look right. And you can see that yellow and cyan after image that shows up. Eventually. <laughs> but the, this is a cool image because what this teaches people and what this shows people is that your perception of vision is not just based upon what it is you see. Sometimes it's based upon your state of adaptation. And also think about this in your career. You will have times where you have really sucky days. Over a 20 year period, I've had some really sucky times where I've had to accept my own weaknesses and I've had to grow from my own weaknesses. And I've had some really great times. But it's a state of adaptation. I have to recognize that the long haul and the journey, whether it's been getting to the place that you want to go directly, or whether you've had to take a little bit of a detour to get there, the goal has been to reach the objective. So enjoy the journey. And I hope that uh, I hope that I see you again sometime soon. I know I'll be seeing one of you at least. All right, thank you. And if you would introduce yourself also. Um, so when I was 18. Oh, Mark, was, can you repeat the question? Because those of us uh, who are uh, remote yeah. can't hear what people in the audience are saying. Sure. So the question is, uh, when I when I went to do my undergraduate degree, I didn't know what a PhD was. I didn't know what a master's was. What was the motivation for why I went to college, essentially? Um, you know, when I was when I was eighteen years old, nineteen years old, I was really interested in computers. I mean, really interested in computers. I love coding, I love doing all that kind of stuff. So I knew that there was something that, that I, I was like, this is, this is a passion of mine. But I went to the university in Swansea in, in England and they basically, they basically said to me, hey, Mark, if you wanna do a computer science degree, you're gonna to have to go back to college and take a year of remediation. So when I say my, my high school transcript is not that good, Believe me, it, it wasn't that good. Um, because I, in my undergraduate degree, I was told I had to do a year of remediation in mathematics in order to be able to qualify to go into the Swansea Computer Science Program. So I had a second passion, which was graphic design. And, uh, and I really enjoyed graphic design. So I, I sat down with a, with a friend and, and he said, well, okay, what about printing? There was a college of print. It wasn't really a university, it was just a college of print. So I went to that college and uh, I just, I loved it. I, I enjoyed it. And it was actually through my industrial experience with 3M, working for Imation, that Chris Edge was the one that introduced me to the concept of the masters in color science, which was a field that fascinated me. So does that, Good question. All right, so there's one question from the Zoom part of the audience, John Riker. John, you can go ahead and ask. 
Hi there, Mark. Um, I was just curious. Um, it seems like you have been uh, throughout your career kind of facing a more um, customer slash project manager type uh, role. So I was just curious, like how you would recommend uh, or how you've seen throughout your career transitioning more from like a more technical design role to maybe a more project manager or customer facing role as an engineer. Sure. Um, good question. How do I describe? Um, so in actual fact, maybe, maybe I didn't communicate very clearly, but my role is technical. I've never managed a single person. I've never managed a project in my entire career. I have been 100% technical career path. That's been my career. So, you know, working with Purdue University on research projects, fundamental computer vision, color imaging research. Um, so I have, in HP, there are two paths that you can take. There's the technical career path and there's the management career path. I chose to stay on the technical career path. That's kind of my personal choice. Um, but part of that is that now that at the level that I'm at, that I spend a lot more focus trying to influence managers and directors on the technology investments that we need our engineers to make, right? So does that, does that answer or does that? So help? I guess, yeah, just to, I guess maybe um, to reframe my question, um, I guess you talked about uh, pitching ideas to kind of groups of executives and such um, and like how communication is so strongly important in that. Um, I guess my question is like, how do you kind of relay to uh, teams that will be deciding budget and such um, your ideas in, I mean, I mean, I guess the most digestible format for them to get on board um with your ideas yeah that's a great question so so yeah so the most important thing at senior management level is what is it costing this business if we don't fix this problem and what does it cost the customer so if you can take your technology and you can get rid of the technical um, stuff it's all good stuff get rid of the technical part and replace it with what's the value to the customer of having this technology and what's the value to the business in terms of dollars, they will understand that principle. And that's what I've had to do, right? I, Jan, Professor Alabak and I worked on a technology almost 10 years ago, and that technology is coming to the market next month. And that technology basically the research was how do you take a customer document or a printer and how do you identify the types of defects that are in that printer so that you can message service and then you can give guidance. Well, what is the how what well, think about that problem, right? What does the company care about? They care about the cost of service. What does the customer care about? They care about the fact that they're calling a service technician in and it may take them two or three days. They're not like Johnny on the spot. They don't show up within, they don't show up that quick. Their printer is down. What's the value to the business? Can you speak in terms of the millions of dollars of value to the business if you don't fix this thing that you're doing? Or the value of the business in terms of opportunity, right? If you come up with some new technology, how much value does that have that you can't capture today without? Good question. All right, we have time for one final question. Go ahead and introduce so, yourself. Hi. So my question is, um, so you said you also handle like intermediate uh, category of uh, 11 of students or banks that you have in companies. So, the person you found it very hard to uh, communicate with your management or your manager for that matter when it is remote like because of the COVID situation. That you have. So uh, how did you handle this like gap? Uh, okay. Was this difficult? Uh, 
So the, yeah, so the question was, given the hybrid working model, uh, how do you communicate when you can't actually see people? I would say my rule number one is I, not all the time, but I would say 90% of the time my camera is on. And it's not because I like looking at myself. <laughs> <laughs> there is so much communication that is not verbal. And if you're trying to convince somebody or if you're trying to sell an idea or a concept and you're trying to convey that with slides, which PowerPoint is good and helpful, but if you're hiding behind PowerPoint and they can't see the face, they can't see the excitement or they can't see the expression of why you think this is a good technology, then that's a barrier. So, I 90% of the time now I, I have my camera on because then I, and I tell my colleague in Korea, I, you know, I said, your leadership is by example. And how do you lead by example when your camera's not turned on? They just hear a voice on the phone. You have 50 people on a call, and there's this voice. If you know them really, really well, you don't need the camera on. Yeah, I get it. But having the camera on is is one of the key things that I've been trying to make sure of. So that's a wonderful note to end this on. And, and I think it strikes very close to home. We've had all of these sessions virtual and this was in person. I could feel the just the difference in enthusiasm, the difference in energy right there in the lab and so many of you showed up in person. This was a wonderful way to end the semester, and uh, let's thank Mark. And all the coming up that we want to share with Mark. And if you get a picture with me, Mark, for everybody, and Chia, you can come over. Let's take a couple more. Very hard, right? Yeah, so you help yourself. I enjoy this. It was really this fun. was a wonderful way to show the nonlinear nature of your career. I think that's what oftentimes when you just look at the bio of somebody very successful, I think this is a pretty less straight line. Where it's, it's been a lot of yeah. Yeah. I, I I was doing a talk one time with Gracie Stay and Stuart asked me a question. So we were back to it. This was hard. Yeah, was like, yeah. And it's good that you know you've been able to stay with the company and grow within the company. It speaks a lot about HP and it speaks even more about the your age. Yeah, it's become it's been great. It's not perfect, but it's and you've seen lots of changes at HP over the years. Yes. Now, That's a good place. something else that you said also resonated is, you know, that a certain, by the way, if you want to help yourself to some food, we generally go out for lunch. Okay. And you're going to have a long day before you're going to get dinner. So. <laughs> You're going to sit through several presentations. Yeah, we've got a couple more, but I enjoy the presentations actually. I, I really love the so Yeah, I mean, it's good that you're able to, you like the engagement with the student. And that's exactly what this class is meant for. It's meant for people to engage with two kinds of people. One is superstars who establish themselves, and the other is the rising star people, maybe five years or so into it. That's cool. I just wanted to put it now. Yeah, it was not a quick question, but I couldn't get it right here. So when you're just starting with the career, 
you know, you really think about business and bad, so like, you're gonna add on, like, to continue yeah. the most. So, like, okay, as an engineer, especially, like, I love that. They're like, okay, I'm gonna fast. Yeah. And maybe if you have a little bit of business time, you're gonna know from the discussion of your team that uh, what that, how, how that's gonna impact like revenue, exactly. but that's not very it's about, yeah. yeah. And so um, eventually, that's how you make like revenue grow, and that's how you make like whether something that's why you get it like three years. So how do you develop? Is that like a step that you can develop? Or is that something you can incorporate in the beginning as well? That you don't have time. Yeah. So like for business, phrase is very tiny. You need to develop the business act. I don't even know what that is. And, and the bottom line really for me has been put yourself in situations where you need to be Right. So yeah, you can you can do the technical and you can solve the problems. But when you take yourself out of the technical, you put yourself into the eyes of the customers, yourself into the eyes of the customers. Okay, 